I thought I was done. I thought I was done with this game. And I could finally move on to something else. I was getting ready to complete watching the long four-hour video, nearly four hours, called The Evil Within Part 1 Complete Edition. And just as a prelude, I am very, very impressed by The Evil Within. Okay, I was getting ready to complete watching it at the request by one of my friends and make a video about what I thought about the game and its several aspects and the story itself and whatnot. I was getting ready for that. And then I came across a video. I came across a certain remark from the person I least expected that demanded that I make an elaborate response to it. Welcome, everyone. This is your boy, from Weird Science, the Bengal Dragon. Make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons, as all your support really helps me remain motivated to continue making a variety of different type of videos on this channel, covering many areas of entertainment. Now, I'm going to record this over a couple of days, so if you see some changes in the physical appearance, or a change in my voice because I'm just starting to get over a cold, please bear with it. I came across two specific podcasts. One is by The Residents of Evil. The other is by Crimson Head Podcast. These podcasts happened in 2017. And yes, I know I am five years too late. But people, keep in mind, this is the year for some reason I rediscovered Code Veronica and it seems to me that I am the only person, like, unfortunately, I am the only person who appreciates Code Veronica for how unique it is and the protagonist for how unique she is in the entire franchise of Resident Evil. But in those podcasts, more specifically, the Crimson Head one, Allison Court mentioned something. Something to the effect of, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but Claire took Steve like a brother. I don't know how it came off, but Claire basically was the more mature person showing Steve how to survive through a biohazard. That's right. Claire Redfield took Steve Burnside as a surrogate brother. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, you have no idea how hard I face palmed when I heard that Alison Court herself did not understand Claire's character in Resident Evil Code Veronica and Code Veronica X. So this video is a response to that sentiment and a few other comments and remarks I've heard through both the podcasts and my final attempt on answering the question that I left to interpretation in the previous video. In this video, I'm finally going to answer what did Steve mean to Claire in Code Veronica X, not Dark Side Chronicles. I will get to why in the video itself. But for now, what did Steve mean to Claire? Now, let's finish this once and for all. You tell him, Michael Flipowick. And by the way, why don't you do more podcasts with him? First of all, Allison Court, if you are listening to this, a huge shout out to you and thank you for all the entertainment in several forms of media you have provided throughout the decades, okay? I'm not an actor myself, but I have been involved with some amateur level stuff and believe me, it is very hard and very, very draining. So, Allison Court, thank you very much for all your hard work. But moving on and responding to your comment. This is how 
Claire's character has been presented from Resident Evil 2 to Resident Evil Degenerations. Claire Redfield is one of the nicest human beings that you can find, but she is not a doormat because usually women this nice are doormats like Yuna from Final Fantasy X. She is very compassionate and she wants to help people by default as long as you are someone that she does not dislike. And she dislikes very few people. She knows how to survive and use weapons. She has survived at least two biohazards, one of the only characters to have done so, who has zero confirmed romantic interests. And it is shown that she is not that interested in that type of relationship anyways. But there is one exception, and that exception is Steve Burnside. So this whole notion that she is a girl who dates several men at the same time, but is not exclusive to anyone, is complete baloney. Because her in-game behavior contradicts this type of approach to men. And finally, if this matters to anyone, just saying, she's at least God conscious, as in she believes in a higher God power, she is not an atheist. I have presented all of these points and the evidence that go along with it in my previous videos analyzing Claire Redfield and the hidden story everyone missed about Code Veronica and Claire Redfield. The links to those are also in the description below. Now, with regard to Steve Burnside, there's a reason why the Crimson Head podcast and nearly everyone else went directly to love interest and did not go to surrogate brother. This is because in the game, there is no indication of Claire looking at Steve as a surrogate brother. Let's break this down. First interaction, Claire holds Steve at gunpoint then decides he is not a threat. And then Steve condescends to her and blows her off. Next interaction. Steve Chris does Redfield. something in is five minutes or something? that Claire like Redfield brother? could not ah, do in three months. Your siblings. Steve Burnside finds out where Chris is. Well, it seems Keep this in mind as this will become very important later on in this video. But anyways, in that interaction, Steve Burnside condescends to Claire again and blows her off. And also calls her real brother unreliable. There's no way he could get here, even if he is your brother. Yes, he can. I'm sure of it. No, not at all. Next interaction. Claire saves Steve from a gas chamber. And if you take too long, Steve sort of condescends to Claire again, then cuts a deal to trade the Lugers for machine guns, and then blows her off again. Adios. Hey, wait, Steve! Next interaction. Steve rescues Claire from the Snatcher, and then condescends to Claire again, implying that she is a dainty princess who needs a knight in shining armor to protect her. And what confirms that this is condescending? Steve actually bows and courtesies to just rub it in a bit more. And by this time, Claire has shown that she has had enough of Steve's condescending and allows Steve to take care of the zombies himself. Next interaction. After you clear that scenario, depending on how you clear it, Steve somewhat condescends to Claire again. Because in one of the ways, Steve basically says that, well, um, it was too easy. I left some for you because you need the workout. And then Steve proceeds to give Claire life lessons. Being two years younger than her, Steve proceeds to give Claire life lessons on how guns are more reliable than any person. You see, this thing is a lot more reliable than any person. 
ironically enough, the one line Claire quotes Steve verbatim 13 years after Steve said it once. Did you notice the repetitive pattern of blowing off and condescending again and again from Steve? Okay. Allison Court also mentioned something that Steve was trying to flex in front of Claire. That's not a flex. You don't flex in front of a girl by insulting her and blowing her off again and again. That is not a flex. Also, notice Claire never shows a single act that implies that Claire sees Steve as a younger brother. Because we have seen Claire be an elder sister before. She does this with Sherry. She does this with Ronnie. She does this with Moira. Not with Steve. To Steve, by this point, we get that Claire sees Steve as a tolerable annoyance who is somewhat likable. That's it. Not a surrogate brother. Notice Claire's reaction right after Steve says that line that guns are more reliable than any person. Than people? Steve, what were you doing here? Who brought you here and where is your family? Shut up! Of course, Claire would respond this way. This is the classic scenario of diametric opposite character people. Claire is a person who really likes helping people and is trusting of people for the most part. And she meets someone who trusts a weapon more than people, saying that guns are more reliable than any person. So obviously she's going to react this way. However, there is no big sisterly reaction. This is just a personal reaction, a personal contradiction reaction, that she was surprised that someone would react this way. Also notice, after this point, Claire does not get annoyed by Steve anymore because in her mind, Steve's annoying behavior has now an explanation that something so traumatic happened that Steve now feels that guns are more reliable than any person. Claire picked this up immediately after this interaction. Let's get going. Remember Sherry, everyone? When Sherry was distressed, Claire calmed her down by talking. Claire did no such thing to Steve till this point in the game. When Steve kills his zombie father and mourns his loss, notice Claire's reaction. It's okay now. Just rest. That is not how an elder sister would behave. An elder sister, anyone who has had an elder sister, would give you a shoulder to cry on if the elder sister or the surrogate elder sister views the person crying as a brother. This reaction implies what you see in Code Veronica is that Claire views Steve as a friend. And in Dark Side Chronicles, the inferior story, Claire does even less, by the way. At least in Code Veronica, Claire puts a hand on Steve. In Dark Side Chronicles, they just move on, do nothing. <laughs> The vaccine that saved you. Mommy never... <laughs> and also, some of you might say that, oh, Sherry is a child, Rani is a child. Well, Steve is not old. Steve is still a teenager. He is 17. And even at that age, Supposed brothers and sisters hug each other. Didn't Claire hug Chris? 
upon their reunion. Next interaction. Steve barges in, rescues Claire from a cross-dressing uh, Alfred holding a sniper rifle, uh, chases Steve. after Alfred, and then decides door. that both of them, Steve and Claire, needs to escape. Notice, Steve is actually holding his own. Claire is not doing anything. So the relationship here is still friends. And there is no indication of Claire showing Steve how to survive a biohazard. Next interaction, we get the seaplane. Yeah, Steve apologizes first because he realized that even after mistreating Claire, Claire still cooperated with Steve and treated him well. Okay, and when Steve says that he knows what it's like to be alone, What's Claire's reaction? Oh, Steve. Oh, Steve. That is a friend who understands me reaction that is a friend who i know what you're going through reaction it's not until the mess up with the gas leak where steve is in a state of it's despair and claire is talking him Don't out of that. that state of despair Listen to, me. to calm we'll down from here and then Together. what does claire do she if says split up, we'll let's split up we can it. have a better chance of stopping the gas leak now now, if you played the game, you as Claire have to do everything. You get the valve, you get the right shape, you get the gas mask, and you go and turn the gas off. Steve doesn't do anything. If Claire saw Steve as a younger brother, which elder sister would say that, oh, okay, don't be sad, but leave me alone. Then we can solve this problem more quickly. Just leave me alone. By the end of the Nosferatu battle, it becomes obvious that Steve caught feeling for Claire. If anyone missed or closed their eyes during that cringe trying to kiss a sleeping Claire scene, okay? And Claire, for her part, notice her guard starts to come down quite a bit around Steve. In fact, her inner child starts to come out. Just pay very close attention to how Claire delivers these two lines. We did it! We're finally out! <laughs> Perfect! We'll be able to ride right over to the Australian base with this! And from Steve's perspective, listen, I get it. I get it why Steve fell in love with Claire in one day. Claire caught him at the lowest point of his life his dad betrayed him and due to that betrayal his mom got killed he was in prison his dad got turned into a zombie he had to kill his zombie dad he lost everything and the person he's supposed to rely on the most his dad basically proved that even the people in your family are not reliable Steve was at the lowest point of his life. And then this Claire Redfield comes along and treats him right, treats him good, despite Steve treating her badly initially. Okay, so there is a very strong mental and emotional connection, much more than a physical one for Steve as well. And that is why this line was said. I'm glad that I met you. Indicating that before dying, he is glad to have met someone as wonderful and as amazing as Claire. God, I have to explain this to you guys. But for all you Steve Burnside fans, I am not one of them because that still does not excuse him trying to kiss a sleeping Claire. I'm also much more into Batman type characters and God of War type characters, but to all you Steve Burnside fans, there you go. Next point. 
when Chris rescues Claire. Claire describes Steve as a boy who escaped from that island with me and whatnot. Never once does Claire say he is like a brother to me. Okay? And you see that Claire goes to search for Steve with more urgency in a map or in a setting that is more familiar to Chris because this resembles the Spencer Mansion. So this once again indicates that Steve means a lot to Claire, but not as a surrogate brother because there is no evidence of Claire treating Steve as a surrogate brother. You've got to save Steve. Go! God, I never thought I will have to analyze this scene because it is so obvious. But Allison Court's comment, surrogate brother? I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what? To heck with it. I will analyze this scene because it's so obvious to me. I don't know, man. I feel like Captain Hindsight from South Park. Okay, that Captain Hindsight has a lot of intelligence, but he feels that his gift is a curse. Finally, pay very close attention to this last scene of Steve's life. Okay, even if you are Allison Court, pay very close attention to the vocal tone, the body language, and even the music that is used even the dialogue because this is how it was presented in code veronica and code veronica x this is how it was presented so pay very close attention to it Hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there. Okay? Uh this, this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I now believe a transition of perception happened of how Claire views Steve. Steve went from being a very, very good friend to something a lot more personal and maybe even intimate to Claire, much more deeper. Oh, and Steve. this. This change in vocal tone, this how she slowly brings herself next to Steve with a body language that seems more intimate. Even the way she holds his hand and gently caresses his face, it all shows that Steve means something extremely deep and important to Claire, not just a friend and Definitely not a surrogate brother because this is not a surrogate brother treatment. Damn it. I have to explain this to you guys. I feel like WCW Scott Steiner being asked to critique the Little Mermaid. How could he get this so wrong, Allison? My brother's come to save us. We're getting out of here. Your brother kept his promise. I'm sorry, I cannot. Instead, what is a reaction? What? What are you saying? Claire acts surprised, indicating very strongly that Claire never took Steve as her younger brother in Code Veronica and Code Veronica X. To add to this, even her voice, she starts sounding like Lunette 
in this last moments of Steve's life scene. This indicates that her mental guard around him is at zero and emotionally she is completely exposed. This is not a surrogate brother or surrogate sister treatment. This is much more akin to a love interest treatment. I love you, Claire. Steve? 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 God, not this part. I have to analyze this part. Okay, I'll do it. Even the way she hugs her knees, increasingly folding up like an accordion, trying to crush herself into Steve's lifeless chest. That's right. Her mind took such a powerful hit from Steve's death that she started crying like a six-year-old girl. Her mind went back from 19 to 6. That is not surrogate sister. That is very close to soulmate. This is a very old school type Japanese or Eastern love storytelling where the girl falls in love with the guy on an emotional level and a mental level before a physical level. This is why... You see a lot of this in anime and even in old Bollywood movies. And this is why in my first video in the series, I brought back the Bolly Critic. Maybe I'll bring him back again if I'm ever reviewing Resident Evil Degenerations because boy, does the Bolly Critic have a lot to say about Degenerations. And keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Claire Redfield is a Japanese character with an American nationality. Even the music that is used here, which by the way is called Love or I Love You, this orchestral Steve. rendition of Lacrimal. Even Capcom is telling you that the Steve. sorrow here is of Claire losing a love interest, not a surrogate brother. And that is why, wait, what's wrong with my voice? Damn it, I need some venom, I mean coffee. Oh, that's better. I am smarter than you think. And this whole open to interpretation bit. Folks, it's not that subjective. Especially in this case, I don't buy it. Because in Degenerations, Claire has clearly shown that despite still being a surrogate sister to Ronnie, to Sherry, even to Leon, there is something there that every time something even vaguely reminds her of Steve, almost all the time she has an involuntary reaction as if something in that interaction or in that moment struck a very sensitive and exposed nerve. And yes, I have shown how all of these clips are actually references to Claire's loss of Steve and the aftermath of Claire's psyche after losing Steve. And by the way, Claire treats Rodrigo Here, as a surrogate brother in quote Veronica. Keep it. It was a gift from my brother, but... Claire also treats Leon as a surrogate brother. You want proof of that? Here is the proof. When did you two go diving? Hmm? And that is how... Wait, not again? There we go. That is why I have Venom. Damn it. Analyzing a 19-year-old girl and how she cries. Alison Court, if you're listening to this or if you're watching this, you know I love you as a performer and as a consistent, diligent, hard worker who has been in this industry for so many years, for decades. And this is coming from a guy who understands that this industry it really takes a physical, mental, and psychological toll on performers. Okay? I understand that. And this is just a very hypothetical realm. Just a small hint that I got. Very subjective. This was starting to be somewhat hinted at 
from what I heard in your interviews and podcasts. But that comment, surrogate brother? Good Lord, Allison, how could you get this so wrong? I don't know. I don't know what your dialogue notes said about the delivery of those lines. Even that line that was not used. And yes, I went through the unused lines as well. There is no dialogue that clearly shows that Claire takes Steve as her surrogate brother. Even the line about breaking his toy that you and Layla Johnson actually referenced in the podcast. That in context, you have to keep the context in mind. That in context was Claire condescending back to Steve because right before that, Steve was in maximum mode in condescending and belittling Claire. So much to the point that he even did a fake courtesy bow just to rub it in on how weak Steve thinks Claire is. That she's some type of fairy tale princess locked up in a tower that needs help with everything. You wish. And no, that is not Steve flexing. That is not him trying to impress Claire. If you think Claire thinks that way, then you probably think that Claire is so naive that she hasn't interacted with that many men in her life. Do you want me to take care of this for you, little boy? And given Claire's established character, of course that is how she's going to condescend. Now, if it were someone like Ada Wong or maybe even Jill Valentine, she'd probably say something like, what's wrong, kid, waiting for your balls to drop? Anyways. That interaction with Claire and Leon at the end of Degeneration, that is how a surrogate sister acts to a surrogate brother, teasing that brother for having a girlfriend. So that inner child in Claire is still there. This only means that if she is still suppressing what happened to Steve after even 13 years, evidently, might I add, whilst being a surrogate sister to so many people, this only means that Steve meant something different to her, not a brother. This is why I said soulmate, or in a Western context, you would say her beloved. And this whole open to interpretation bit, ladies and gentlemen, please, let's be realistic, okay? Not every interpretation is true. Even interpretations are subject to evaluation and critique. For example, this way that Claire cries over Steve in Code Veronica. You have seen little girls cry like this when they lose a pet. So by this interpretation, Claire took Steve as her dog? Of course not. God damn it, I am not a dog! Wow, I have a lot to learn. And while we're at this, listen, that Crimson Head podcast, when I heard that there was a part where Alexia gives her big spiel and Claire gets ready to say what she really thinks of Alexia before it turns into a sausage fest or something like that. Something along those lines, Allison Court mentioned. I have no idea what you're babbling about. That never happens. Oh, wait. Now I know where it happens. Yes, it does happen. Even the surrogate brother thing, I know where it happens. This is the game where it happens. Dark Side Chronicles Game of Oblivion. Where Claire is showing Steve how to survive a biohazard. Steve is constantly trying to flirt with Claire, even calling her cute a few times. And honestly, ladies and gentlemen, I found that moment to be very, very, very cringe. I found this Steve less tolerable. Even the big spiel by Alexia. This happens in Dark Side Chronicles because Looking at this sister, time where in Dark Side Chronicles Claire is holding a gun and actually says you. something Don't back you. to Alexia at the very same time in Fort Veronica Alexia doesn't say a single word and what is Claire doing Claire is holding her chest in fear something she never did even in Raccoon City or up to this point in her biohazard survival career.
This is how I know that Dark Side Chronicles not only told an inferior story, it told a different story. Even the immediate aftermath of Steve's death on Claire's psyche and how she broke down, this suggests that even Claire realized that she is not as strong as she thought. How did that other Linkin Park song go again? I'm strong on the surface, not all the way through. So why Code Veronica is the superior story? Because in Code Veronica, it is shown that Claire gets much more emotionally hurt than she does in Dark Side Chronicles. And this hurt is important because the recovery journey is longer. And Revelations 2 has shown that she is still on this journey. So why would anyone want to take this away from her? Forgetting all the hurt inside you've learned to add so well. So this beloved Steve angle, where even from Claire's side, it ends up being a love story as well. This hurts her more. And this leads to a longer road of recovery compared to Dark Side Chronicles. Games like The Last of Us, the first one, and even God of War 2018 has shown that an emotional trauma recovery journey has some of the best storytelling and character development potential. Why would you take this away from her, Allison? But I actually think I know what happened. Allison Court actually confused Code Veronica for Dark Side Chronicles because a lot of the things she mentions in the podcast actually end up happening in Dark Side Chronicles, not in Code Veronica. Now, why she got confused with the two, I don't know. But I'm sorry to disappoint you, Allison, with all due respect. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Code Veronica is very much a love story, first from Steve's side and eventually from Claire's side as well. And I have shown that time and time again, the latest in this video itself. And why this aversion from a love story by some people? Do people actually think that Claire also falling in love with Steve by the end of his life, also in one day, makes her weaker or makes her character look worse than if Claire took Steve as her surrogate brother? If that is the case, let me take everyone back to everyone's favorite PS1 game. Forgive me. Damn! That's right. Amidst all the complex storytelling, wasn't there an 18-hour love story between Snake and Meryl? Didn't Snake eventually grow to love Meryl, just like Claire grew to love Steve? Didn't the less experienced person in that situation fall in love with Snake first in Metal Gear Solid, just like Code Veronica? Steve, having never survived a biohazard before, fell in love with Claire first, someone who has already been in a biohazard? Ironically enough, both games have the first encounter where the girl is holding up the guy at gunpoint. So, if Snake grows to fall in love with Meryl in one day, that's fine. But if Claire grows to fall in love with Steve also in one day, that's not fine? Social media, you know what to do with this. To add to this, I counted. Claire saves Steve's life three times. Steve saves Claire's life six times in Code Veronica X. Well, that file shows the latitude and longitude of this place. <laughs> Why don't you send your brother the coordinates and ask him to come help? Thanks. I'll do that. Well, that file shows the latitude and longitude of this place. <laughs> Why don't you send your brother the coordinates and ask him to come help? Thanks. I'll do that. Huh. Huh. That was too close. No! Father! What's 
going on? Uh. Ah! Steve! It's all my fault. We're safe now. Think again, Claire. I shall enjoy watching you shriek in agony. Not this time! You gay! <laughs> You're alive! Showing Steve how to survive a biohazard. And on top of that, it was indicated that by the end, Claire had almost lost the will to fight because she was so hurt and devastated by the loss of Steve. Just like Snake, Otacon had to talk him out of a state of despair. What the hell do you know? People, do you now see why I now believe that for some weird, strange reason, maybe I'm the only person who understands the Claire Redfield character at this depth. And why I feel that this is so weird, because this is so obvious to me that I can figure this out even in my sleep. And I'm like, what's going on? I understand her better than her own voice actress, Alison Court. And even compounding to all this, Snake never took Meryl as his surrogate sister. Snake grew to love Meryl, just like Claire grew to love Steve. This is why this surrogate brother, this angle, it absolutely does not work. Furthermore, this facial expression at the very end of Code Veronica, where you can sort of make out her neck vein, and you can sort of see a lump in her throat, as if she just got done swallowing something or is trying I'm to sorry, swallow Claire, the lump in her throat. It's not as if yet. she's trying to There's choke up. We've got to People, please try and understand. Capcom animated this in. Just like the signs of the mild broken heart syndrome. Where they could have left it alone. They animated this in. Indicating that they wanted to tell this layer of the story with Claire Redfield. And it's not like Chris said anything offensive. Chris said the same thing pretty much that Leon said at the end of Resident Evil 2, the canonical ending. We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. All those collective words. Same thing. Chris is saying, There's still something we've got to do. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now. Let's finish this once and for all. All these collective words. But in Resident Evil 2, Claire acts just mildly surprised. In this one, when Chris tells her the same thing, Claire is showing an expression as if she's about to erupt like a volcano, bursting out crying. And this can only mean that this is because of what happened to Steve. This also indicates that after Chris, Steve, a guy she knew for one day, became the most important person in her life and she couldn't save him. Steve cannot be a surrogate brother to Claire. It's something much deeper than that. And what was it that the Joker told Batman? Behind all the sturm and batarangs, you're just a little boy in a play suit crying for mommy and daddy. In a similar way, behind all the activism and fervor and severe hatred for anyone associated with biohazards, Claire Redfield is still that 19-year-old girl crying over the loss of Steve. Kudos to Capcom for animating this. This, ladies and gentlemen, after all that Steve has done for her, even inadvertently found her brother, facilitated this very escape, saved her life so many times, confessed his love for her, Claire told Steve so many times that they'll get out of there together. And Claire couldn't save him. This is not surrogate brother treatment. 
this is in the Japanese culture, okay? Because this is an Eastern story. And keep in mind, I told you before, Claire is a Japanese character with an American nationality. This is the Aishiteru type of love, not the Daisuke type of love, the more deep, deep type of love thing. This is the story being told. To her credit, S.D. Perry actually captured some of this accurately enough in her novelization of Code Veronica. Yeah, there were a lot of stupid moments, but this relationship between Claire and Steve, yeah, even there, by the end, Claire actually starts to like, like Steve. Now, putting together the Residents of Evil and the Crimson Head podcast, Alison Code brought up Degenerations a lot, actually, and how Claire's character has matured and moved on or whatever. At least that's what was implied. Now, here is how it is actually presented if you actually pay very close attention. Claire only moved on after suppressing what happened to Steve, not coming to terms with what happened to Steve. Let me just give you one example on top of all that I have shown you. This reaction, given the context of everything, this reaction is a reference to Raccoon City only if Code Veronica didn't happen and Leon used his government connections to find out where Chris is, which would make Code Veronica absolutely unnecessary. And they might go that route with Resident Evil 4. That if Claire makes a cameo, Leon will just reveal that I found your brother for you in a month using my government connections. They might go that route and that would make Resident Evil Code Veronica completely unnecessary. But this reaction and Attention. this reaction, these two data points, if they are to be connected, this can only happen if Code Veronica happened and both of these and other data points are actually references to Code Veronica and specifically the aftermath of losing Steve on Claire's psyche. I have shown this to great detail in my previous video. Just look it up. It all goes back to Steve. I'm not going to repeat myself here. To compound to all this, Resident Evil Survivor 2 has shown that Claire, in the immediate aftermath of losing Steve, actually starts to go somewhat mad as an insane and starts to have hallucinations, which she calls nightmares. Allison also indicated that towards the end of Degenerations that Claire has finally moved on and lived happily ever after or something. That is not the case because Revelations 2 happened where it is shown again that Claire actually went back to suppressing what happened to Steve which explains the cringing in pain reactions the times that you see it, given the context as well. And also the reference to guns being more reliable than any person repeated verbatim after all these years. This, coupled with the fact that no one, and I mean no one, not Moira, not Neil, not Barry, not even Alex Wesker, and not even her co-workers, the other ones that you somewhat save in the beginning but end up being monsters anyways. None of them bring up Steve or the events of Code Veronica. And believe me, it's to the point where there is actually a small group of Resident Evil fans who believe that because of this ignorance, because of this aversion, Code Veronica is not canonical. Okay? It's avoided that much. But if Code Veronica were canonical and it's avoided that much, this would only mean that the only people by this time who are left alive who know what really happened are Claire, Chris, and Claire's therapist who knows what really happened during the events of Code Veronica. Also meaning that this is the one event Claire or Chris did not tell anyone. Because telling someone would be too painful, especially for Claire. Couple this with the fact that in the entire series, given the series veterans, Claire is the only one without a confirmed love interest. Chris, 
Jill, Leon, Ada, they are much farther along. Hell, Ethan Winters had a family before the biohazard involvement. Even Albert Wesker. Wasn't there a scene which indicated that Wesker was making out with someone in Resident Evil 5? The only person who doesn't get this treatment is Claire. And I think this is by design. This is by Capcom storytelling design. And for everyone who brings up Neil, come on. Neil is the only person in the entire series who Claire mentions is not her boyfriend. And for all of you who believe that, you know, she dates several men at the same time and blah, 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 blah all this. Okay. Such as, and to compound to all of this, Claire is the only series veteran who did not join BSAA. And she has survived by the time three biohazards by Revelations 2. And she still did not join BSAA. So this no military background nonsense, it does not stand because she has shown she has the ability. She has much more ability than even some of the policemen and women. So to add this data point to the alignment, this only means that something so traumatic happened that she just can't bring herself to joining BSA, whereas all of her peers either joined BSA or Stratcom. Only she didn't. That means something unique happened to her. And that is Steve. So putting all of this together, given the evidence, given all that I have shown, and by the way, if you want to bring up the comics, okay, in the latter comic that told the story of post-Revelations 2, which many people think are not canonical, but just for argument's sake, okay, just for argument's sake, let's think for one second it's canonical. What does Claire end up doing? She ends up inspecting a biohazard or a supposed biohazard, finds it's an actual biohazard, guns her way through all the monsters, the rocket launchers, everything, runs away and sends the BSAA. She doesn't come back with the BSAA. She doesn't take care of the problem all on its own. No. She escapes and sends the BSAA. This means that the last place on Earth, even more so than normal people, Claire wants to be is in a biohazard. And there's only one reason for that. So, given all of these data points, okay, the evidence I've shown, answer this one question. Now, do you understand why the answer is B? because that is the one that makes the most sense. A and C does not make that much sense. Only B explains a lot about her shown behavior, which is not part of cut content or not part of blooper reels or not part of non-canonical material. Dark Side Chronicles, how many times do I have to tell people it tells the inferior story? Okay, even the way Claire cries in Code Veronica. In Dark Side Chronicles, she just cries for like 10 seconds and then leaves. Okay, even that transition part that I mentioned, where Claire is slowly moving next to Steve. In Dark Side Chronicles, she just runs up to Steve, indicating that there is no transition of perception on how Claire viewed Steve. Claire viewed Steve 15, 20 minutes ago the same way she did when she ran up to Steve. And good Lord, I can't believe how stupid the surrogate brother angle is or surrogate relative. I'm sorry I keep nailing this in the head again and again with different hammers, but still, it, it's just so stupid to me. I mean, take Sherry, for example. What if she went like, uh, Leon, my real daddy is in Iran for a few days because he's super busy. So why don't you be my dad? That was a close one. That was pretty impressive back there, Sherry. Not big daddy, it's regular daddy.
Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the real Batman making a guest appearance in this video. And in case you missed the explanation, I am legally blind. And Bruce Wayne, the imposter and the thief, stole most of my money and my identification papers. Left me with just enough for some cheap sunglasses, a cheap t-shirt I bought from Amazon, a cheap microphone, and a cheap piece of software where I still can't even hide my real name. But enough about that. Allison Court, along with Layla Johnson, mentioned something about the lost opportunities and the missed potential with Code Veronica, especially with the villains. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with that. Because as we are on the topic of surrogates and substitutes, I think someone like the Joker or the Scarecrow or even the Mad Hatter would have actually fit very well in that universe. Even Alfred Ashford kind of reminds me of Two-Face, but the two faces are actually two personalities that come out during stress situations and they don't exist at the same time. And by the way, if you missed the story of Two-Face, yes, he has a third personality as well. And something like that would be unbelievably interesting to explore had they gone with the proposed trilogy that I have suggested in the previous video. For instance, the trauma of Claire Redfield, the Joker would have loved to have caused that. The Scarecrow would have loved to explore her trauma and her mental state. Even the Mad Hatter would have loved to control her hallucinations after she left the Antarctica base or something along those lines. So there was a lot of potential there. But as it stands right now, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but Claire Redfield is not a badass anymore. The boss from Metal Gear Solid 3 is a badass. Andrea Beaumont from Mask of the Phantasm is a badass. And my suggestion could have turned Claire Redfield into a badass like Andrea Beaumont. Sarah Connor is a badass. Even to an extent, as annoying as she is, Cassie Cage from Mortal Kombat is a badass. Because all of these women, they went through loss, but they did not remove themselves from the front lines of battle. Claire Redfield did. She constantly tries to remove herself from the front lines of battle, only steps into the front lines if there is no other way. Even Ayane from Dead or Alive, good God, Ayane is one of the most underrated female badasses in all of gaming. Her life was filled with nothing but neglect, betrayal, petricide, you name it. And she came to the point of slitting her own throat, but still she did not give up on her family, on her clan. She did not give up on ninjutsu. She actually took a leadership role in one of her ninja clans. She did not remove herself from the front lines of battle, but Claire Redfield did. And that is okay. That is not a problem. What was it that Roy Campbell told Solid Snake in Metal Gear Solid 4? We all can't be as strong as you, Snake. And that is a very human trait to have. Not everyone can be as equally strong as every champion that they see. But enough about that. What caught my attention more was that you suggested you wanted to do a bit more of an intimate dialogue exchange with Albert Wesker's voice. Richard Waugh and that other guy, to a point where he even suggested a Claire sandwich, you know, a vocal sandwich, if you will, having that type of interaction and having fun whilst voicing Claire between the two Weskers. That's fine. I mean, me personally, if I was voicing Bruce Wayne, I would love to be in such a situation with Kimberly Brooks playing Batwoman and Laura Bailey playing Catwoman. But enough about that. What caught my attention was that you perhaps indicated that you wanted to be a villain. Very, very interesting. At this point in her career, should Alison Court play a villain? One name comes to mind. And I believe you have at least some connection in the comic book industry. So this one name, maybe these connections can help you get better insight into this one name. Punchline. That's right. One of the newest characters in Batman. The literal female Joker. I specifically want Alison Court 
to play this role if they ever give Punchline a voice. Because, don't forget, Allison Court has played a TV clown for six seasons. Allison Court has played one of the most unique characters in a survival horror genre game in Claire Redfield, the Code Veronica type specifically, not the one from Dark Side Chronicles, because that is a downgrade. I'm talking about the one from Code Veronica specifically, Code Veronica X. Can Allison Court combine those two and turn that combined personality into something who has a charm about her, but who is also sadistically manipulative and evil? I would love to see Allison Court in that role. But as for Richard Waugh, try these names for slices of bread in your sandwich, Allison. David Hayter, Dave B. Mitchell, Bruce Greenwood, and Kamran Nikad. I bring up Dave B. Mitchell is because I honestly feel he's one of the most underrated voice actors, especially when he does a particular voice. If you've seen Mortal Kombat Legends, he does the voice of Raiden. If you've seen Mortal Kombat 11, he does the voice of Geras. That particular voice where he has a lot more command in his deliveries. I want to see that out of Wesker and even out of Sher Khan. And Kamran Nekad, why do I bring him up? He actually played Albert Wesker in a parody of Resident Evil Code Veronica called Resident Evil Code Quan Chi. And I honestly feel, considering that I'm a guy whose world revolves a lot more around sound than it does around sight, Kamran Nekad actually outperformed Richard Waugh, in my opinion. Richard Waugh is good. Don't get me wrong. But something about the Albert Wesker voice, when he does an excited voice or an angry voice or a determined voice or anything except a common collected suave voice, his voice acting falls apart. He starts to sound a lot more like a radio announcer. And Kamran Nekad has actually delivered those multitude of emotions with Albert Wesker, I believe with a lot more competence. So this is why I bring up Kamran Nikad. And in my opinion, this lack of command in that voice is what kept Discount Paul Phoenix. Ain't my style. I mean Albert Wesker from being more intimidating as a villain. And this is coming from Discount Lawrence Fishburne looking Batman. Allison Court, I think should play Punchline if they ever give Punchline a voice. Batman out. That's it. I am done, done, done with this topic. Okay? The only way I'm going to come back is by request or if one of the people I reached out to responds or something like that. Like, I reached out to... Residents of Evil, I reached out to Crimson Hand. I even reached out to Allison Court, okay? You know, for like a brief 10, 15 minute discussion. Paid, of course, because, you know, you have to pay people for their time, especially if you're in the entertainment business. So, yes, I completely understand that. But, yeah, until something like that happens, until I'm asked to collaborate or something, I am completely done. Okay, comment section, yes, I will show up, but as videos, I am done covering this topic. Next video, I'm going to talk about, in this way, the evil within part one. And stick around, there is a post credit scene. <laughs>
and they turned him into a wrestling maniac? Maniac, am I? Man, I didn't even know Pinadoro had a television set, let alone one that received weekly wrestling. And that too, he chose a backbreaker instead of a pile driver? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I see. That would make him Zangief. All right, backbreaker it is. Enough with these words. <laughs>